was a perfect February winter day in Southern California. I was going to go up to LA, my friend's uh, 60th birthday. And as I was crossing the street, a teenage driver, there was a truck at the stop sign, and there's a teenage driver. She didn't see me because of the truck, and she went right through the stop sign, and she hit me at about 25 miles an hour. And I was thrown in the air, th thrown first into her windshield, the windshield sh spider shattered. I was thrown back into the street. And I was, of course, completely dazed. And I, I didn't know what was happening. I couldn't collect my thoughts. I couldn't understand what was happening. Then I saw her run out of the car, open the car door, and I saw the, the terror on her face. And I realized that I'd been hit by a, a car. And, but of course, I had no idea how seriously injured I was, no idea. And uh, an para off-duty paramedic came, and he announced himself, I'm a paramedic. And uh, I, I turned my head to orient towards where the voice was coming from, his voice was coming from. And as soon as I started to move, he s yelled, stop, don't move your head, your neck could be uh, your neck could be broken. Yeah. And so I went back into a deeper shock. And I went in so deeply that I l left my body, which is an experience that traumatized people have. I mean, it was as though I floated above my body and I was looking down at this whole event, seeing my crumpled body laying there and, s and, and, and seeing him you know, commanding me what to do. And then he started firing questions, questions. I mean, you know, what was my name? Where was I going? What's today's date? And I said, please, just leave me alone. I'll answer your questions later. And in being able to do that, I felt a little bit less helpless. Then, some, and he took my pulse, and some little time later, a woman came by and she said, I'm a doctor. I'm a pediatrician, actually. Is there anything I can do? And I said, please sit by me. And she did and she grasped my hand and I could feel her hand and I could smell the scent of her perfume and the soothingness of her voice. And all of that gave me this feeling that I'm not alone. And by having that feeling, I was able to go into my body, into my body, and feel where the shock was locked in my body. And then I was gradually able to let the shock move through, listening to my body in its unspoken voice. And I experienced waves of shaking and trembling. I felt my left hand wanting to go up as the, as it had done to protect my head from hitting on the car, the windshield. And then after a little while, more shaking, more trembling, more waves of heat, waves of rage, red rage, and the, the, the words, how could that idiot, how could she go through a stop sign? I mean, always trauma, you have to have somebody to blame. And, but then, I started, and then feeling my hand come out to protect myself to, from uh, hitting uh, my head against the, the, uh, the, 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 st the road, the, the Highway 1. And um, then the ambulance came, and the, the, the woman was very nice. She l let me use her cell phone uh, to call somebody to meet me at the hospital. And I had asked, can, can we go to the, the local hospital? Because there was one hospital a mile or two away. And she said, no, 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 we have to go to a major trauma center because you very likely have internal bleeding, mm. internal injury. So I said, well, what are, uh, and she t took my, my pulse and my heart rate. And she took it again. And I said, can you tell me what, the pulse, what it is, what my vitals are. And she said, no, I'm sorry, I can only tell that to the doctor. And I said, well, actually, I am a doctor. 
half truth, right? I mean, I <laughs> for the doctor of one kind. And she said, well, I have to check again. She said, something must be wrong. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, your heart rate is 74, your pulse, uh, your, uh, heart, your um, blood pressure is 120 over 70. He said, well, when I talk to the paramedic, your heart rate is at about 160. I don't understand. And so then, of course, I never miss an opportunity to teach. And so I explained to her what I was doing. And she said, and when we just arrived at the hospital, she said, you know, a few weeks ago we had a, a course in, in critical incident debriefing where we all had to talk about, you know, the horrible things that we had experienced. And I felt so much worse after it. But it seems like you didn't do anything like that at all. Would you be willing to come and teach us a class? And I said, sure. And I gave my contact information. But this was, I was greatly relieved that my method worked, for sure. And, but there was another thing that was important. You know, it's nothing that we, nobody can do it for us but we really can't do it alone. I mean, even with 40 years of developing the methodology and working literally with thousands of clients, thousands, um, I don't think I could have done what I did, certainly not as effectively, had that pediatrician, had that woman come there and sat there with her warmth, with her presence. And actually, this conference that we're going to get tomorrow, mm -hmm. it's a really a lot about the presence that the analyst, the therapist, brings to bear as a critical component, maybe even the critical component in what happens in the person's healing. So, you know, there's a Motown song. It goes something like, it takes one to stand in the dark alone, it takes two to let the light shine through. So. I think this is, and a number of my students have, you know, uh, taken this work and developed it in ways that people use it in their own communities. So that when there's a disaster, they are uh, empowered to help each other. Because there's not that kind of mental health capacity, and most of that mental health capacity really doesn't even understand about how to do this work like, like this. So by, by empowering people to help each other, I think we have another tremendously important application of this body of knowledge, of this way of attending to and working with the organism and helping people contact that unspoken voice, the voice without words, that voice which is so profoundly wise and timeless and which will guide us back towards wholeness.